Hello and welcome to Culture Shock. I'm Evan. I'm Brent. And this is Culture Shock. What are we talking about today? We're talking about these gentlemen here, the Shinsengumi. These guys, this looks like a photo. It, it Shinsengumi. Yes. Now, in, in this day and age. <laughs> <laughs> not the actual Shinsengumi in the photograph, unfortunately. They died oh. out quite a while ago. Oh. Um, so the, the Shinsengumi were a group of elite government samurai. Basically, so think of like a SWAT team in oh, modern special stuff. forces. Exactly. So they were in operation back in the 1860s in Japan, um, and they were part of what's called the Meiji Revolution or the Meiji Restoration. Hmm. So basically, um, it all started when Admiral Perry came over from the West, and you all probably know this from school. Uh, so he arrived and he basically demanded that Japan open its doors to the West. Wow. And uh, the shogun at the time agreed and said, okay, we will do this. Hmm. The problem was that there was a shogun and there's an emperor. Oh. The shogun didn't ask the emperor about this. Is, is the shogun under the emperor? Well, that's where it gets complicated. Oh. <laughs> uh, the shogun, uh, way back hundreds of years prior, um, was, uh, was set up as the official ruler of the country after a unifier had basically come in and conquered the country, but didn't want to depose the emperor. So the shogun was the emperor's advisor and the person who actually did all the work. Hmm. Uh, but the emperor was still in control, really. Sure. Uh-huh. Um, so <laughs> Doing yeah, emperor things. Right, exactly. <laughs> in his palace, somewhere else. Um, so the shogun was really running the country and had hmm. been for, for a very long time. Um, so, but the shogun was based in Tokyo, which is now the capital, hmm. whereas the emperor was based in Kyoto, hmm. which is further inland. So was, was that the capital at that point, or it was yes? Oh. So, um, but Tokyo was the main port city, hmm. um, or it was one of the one of the main ports of Japan. Um, so Admiral Perry shows up, and, and the shogun more or less capitulates to uh, Perry. Hmm. A lot of people were not happy with this oh. uh, because, again, the emperor had not been consulted, and this was, uh -oh. this was seen as, as it also just a a big deal to just. Do that. Yeah. Um, so uh, a revolution formed. Uh, wow. A major re revolution. And um, the problem was that... So the revolutionaries basically wanted to do two things. They mm. wanted to depose the shogun, who mm. they felt had now become too powerful and was acting as basically the emperor. He mm. basically usurped the emperor's power. They also wanted to repel the foreigners, or mm. the barbarians, as they call <laughs> us. Um, and they wanted to, to, to get us out of the country. Mm. It was time for Japan to go back to being, you know, none of these foreigners around. We, we, mm. They had to stay strong. Um, now, <laughs> the revolutionaries had very strong tactics uh, in mind. Um, so they wanted to do things like, oh, say, set fire to Kyoto. Um, and just set the entire capital ablaze so that everyone would be running around crazy so they could then kidnap the emperor, take him back to Tokyo, and use him to depose the shogun. Brilliant plan. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Pretty crazy. If they, if they don't burn up uh, the emperor and everybody <laughs> exactly. who's going to do that yes. in the process. Fairly extreme stuff. Um, so this is where things really get complicated, is that you have the shogun who was doing something that, frankly, uh, most historians believe he had no choice but to at least tell the Americans that they were allowed in, hmm. whether they were actually going to do that or not. But he, he really couldn't do anything against those cannons and all, all the technology, technological hmm. power. Uh, but then these revolutionaries said that he was going beyond what he actually was allowed to do. Hmm. But then they were doing things that were more extreme. So it, it, it's who's wow, right becomes yeah. really complicated. So the shogun basically put out a call for all the samurai um, who wanted to to come to him and form this elite group of samurai to um, stop these terrorists, basically. Stop the revolution from occurring. Oh, and so they, they formed, uh, originally it's called the Roshigumi, then the Shinsengumi. And they were this very elite group of samurai uh, that established this very strict set of rules for themselves. Hmm. You've probably heard of Bushido. Yes. The Code of the Samurai. So they believed in Bushido or death. You had to follow wow. Bushido completely. Code to the, exactly. <laughs> to the letter or you... you... If you did not follow it, you had to commit seppuku in front of the rest of the Shinsengumi publicly. That's pretty strict. Yes. <laughs> so That's about as strict as it gets. <laughs> Full-scale um, stuff. Now, 
two sides of that. One is that um, the samurai in general were um, kind of dying out by this point. There were fewer mm. and fewer of them. There were there was fewer. There was less need for them over time, and so a lot of them had been brought up through the peasant class hmm. because there just weren't a lot of samurai having kids. So a lot of the Shinsengumi were former peasants hmm. who had been adopted into samurai clans. Uh -huh. And a lot of them believed very strongly in this. I mean, this was a huge honor. Yeah, to um, be <laughs> suddenly exactly, you from honor. peasant to... Yeah, yeah. To peasant to samurai, samurai to Shinsengumi. Huge Wow. Honor. <laughs> um, so they, they really believed in all this. Hmm. Um, they also got kind of full of themselves. Hmm. The, the, you know, this was such a big deal. Mm. Goes to the goes head. Goes to the head. And samurai in general had become kind of full of themselves in general. Hmm. Um, they really lorded it over people. Samurai could kill peasants out of hand. They didn't need Whoa. a reason for it. Wow, um, a license to kill. Uh, that's, exactly. Um, that's scary. <laughs> yes. Um, and they could just do that whenever they wanted. Gotta be to in the good graces of the samurai at all mm -hmm. time, if that's mm -hmm. the case. Yeah. And Ooh. the samurai were supposed to, like pave their way and do all these things but if they didn't who was gonna who's stop gonna them? stop them yeah, yeah if they have a license to kill you what are you gonna say hey mm -hmm. come back here you gotta pay right. okay here i'll pay you <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. uh, and that debt is paid yeah and that happened a lot <laughs> so um so the shinsengumi developed this reputation within japan of being both a this counterterrorism unit but also throwing their weight around a lot in Japan. Mm. I mean, part of the problem is that they were set up in Kyoto. They were not native to Kyoto. Mm. Um, they had a lot of money, or a fair amount of money, and more as time went on. Um, and there wasn't a lot for them to do a so, lot of the time. So now, originally, they were uh, the Shogun had set them in place, mm -hmm. and he was in Tokyo, right? He was in Tokyo, but... The, the the revolutionary plan was in Kyoto. That's where he needed them. Right. So, that so they, makes they sense. were all sent to Kyoto to take care of that. Yeah. How did they? How did? Oh, wow. How did they deal with the? So um, th that was the problem. Is they had to send out spies. They had to do all sorts of uh, espionage to find out mm. what was going on. Uh, and they found out that um, uh, a lot of them, were, a lot of these revolutionaries, were in this uh, in uh, the, the Ikadaya Inn. And uh, so they basically tried to, and this is a great example of what the Shinsengumi were like in their, in their heyday, is that they, they finally discovered the revolutionaries were positioned in the inn. So the Shinsengumi did the, the proper thing. They called for backup. Uh, they called for their clan's forces to come in. They called for the police. And nobody showed up. Whoa. Whoa. And the belief at the time, and as historians came on, is that, well, if the Shinsengumi take care of this, Great. If they all die, oh darn. Wow. Talk about <laughs> slippery power structures exactly. there. Yeah. Um, so the Sinting Gumi finally had to just go in themselves. Ooh. And they did. They went into, and this is called the Igadaya incident, they went in and they just wiped out dozens of revolutionaries in one night. Um, I, uh, I believe they only had one casualty. Um, it, that wow. Night, the they Gumi were. Yes. <laughs> they um, absolutely, and, and again, these are these are revolutionaries armed with swords. They are effective swords, uh, swords people. But this really established the, Shinsen, the Shinsengumi were the SWAT team of the day. The the elite of the elite. <laughs> absolutely, um, they were just absolutely amazing. Um, but here's the thing, here's the bigger issue. They did stop the revolution from setting fire to Kyoto and all these crazy things, but they didn't stop the revolution. Hmm. The revolution still occurred. They won the battle but lost exactly. the war. <laughs> yes, and, and the war expanded. More people uh, got uh, uh, in part of this war, and so the Shinsengumi had to split up and take part in different battles in different parts of the country, Ooh. which gets Yeah, crazy. subdivide and... Right, um, but also there was kind of this war from within. Because hmm. they were so strict, they kept losing members internally because they would step out of line a little bit. Oh, if they couldn't stay within their code, their own code, yeah. they'd have to, they'd die. Exactly. And they, but so how would they get more? They, well, they could lose out a lot of people exactly. fast by now, mistake. Now, great additions in Gumi were a, a big deal, so they could get in a lot of recruits over time. Hmm. Now, here's the other problem. If you realize that you can get rid of anyone within your own group that you don't like... Uh, just by planting evidence or by accusing oh somebody, my goodness. 
Yeah. The double dealing and backstabbing could suddenly spin out of control. And some of that happened at the highest levels as well. Cool. When people were just set up. Basically. And that erodes the whole yeah. honor House of, of honor. <laughs> yeah. So the Shinsengumi started to sort of collapse over time. Uh, from mm. within and from without. Um, and then because the revolution wasn't going very well, uh, well because the revolution was going well, um, the Shinsengumi were increasingly blamed for the fact that the revolution was winning. Oh. Um, so this is this was a really tough spot. Deterioration from without and within. Yeah. Um, so eventually, the leader of the Shinsengumi, uh, Isami Kondo, was basically called to task for all of this and was beheaded for not stopping the revolution. Wow. Uh, and beheaded publicly. And this was kind of a travesty of justice in a lot of ways because he did his best. Uh, he was leading the Shinsengumi. He certainly did some bad things, but they couldn't stop. You know, it, 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 something like no that. matter what he did, <laughs> right? And, How could and the scale of it um, uh, uh, was was crazy? And the other um, issue about it is that when you think about it, you know, Japan couldn't stop becoming a part of the West. Hmm. There was just eventually, at some point, eventually yeah. people were going to mm. travel. Things were <laughs> ports were going to, and, and that was the thing. Trade. Was, that, that, was, that was the shogun's position: is hmm. that we can't stop this forever. Uh, indeed, eventually the shogun had to abdicate, mm. uh, which was kind of the end of the Shinsengumi and mm. how everything started to collapse. Indeed, most of the Shinsengumi died uh, over the course of the revolution. Very few of them made it out. They either died within the, the revolution or they were called into court as for criminal behavior <coughs> Yep, and killed. So very few wow. of them uh, left out. A few of the uh, higher-ups managed to, to, to uh, make it out of there. Uh, but most of them did not survive. Now this was Meiji. Mei so this was this was um, the beginning of the Meiji period. And Meiji that, period. It's a, it's a, it's a excellent point. It was called the Meiji Revolution, and it ushered in the Meiji era, hmm. which was the from 1860 to the very early 1900s. Oh wow! In Japan, uh, and this was basically the opening of Japan to the West, and the beginning of Japan becoming a. Uh, a, a modernized country. So at that point, did the emperor take more of a leadership role then? Kind of. Or um, what, did yes. another shogun arise? And... Uh, well, um, um, another shogun ar um, uh, arose, but um, basically what evolved was um, a power structure around the emperor. Hmm. Um, so the emperor wasn't really running the country, but advisors and other people were. I um, suppose the emperor wasn't going to let another Shinsengumi come yes. about. And that's the other thing, is that Japan has a long history of military clans more or less running the country. Hmm. There have been samurai clans that were really running the country for a long time. And that was another aspect of it, too, briefly, is that um, the Shinsengumi were backed by one major samurai clan. Hmm. A lot of other samurai clans didn't like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there was political... Some rivalry within, there. Exactly, yeah. where folks didn't want the Shinsengumi to, to succeed. Hmm. Um, and so that's another another reason why things just did not work out. Wow. Yeah. It, it's 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 really uh, uh, fascinating. Now you do see this pop up in, in anime in various mm. um, places. Probably the most famous is in Rurouni Kenshin. Mm. Uh, Rurouni Kenshin is set in the Meiji era, a few years into the Meiji mm. era, and the main character was a fighter for the revolution. Mm. He was an assassin actually for the revolution, and various members of the Shinsengumi who survived show up in the show. Mm. Uh, now, it must be pointed out. Rurouni Kenshin is not historically accurate in terms of its characters. <laughs> um, it's, it's overall setting and it's overall world. Historical fiction. Yes, it's, it's historical fiction. It is a great example of what life was like in the Meiji era, but the writer very much reworked a lot of historical characters for his narrative. Hmm. Uh, but it's a, it's a great way of, of getting a, a sense for what it was like. So, so is, th is that because there weren't a lot of records kept at that time? It's a good point. It's, it's, it's one of the complexities, is that um, records were very rough at the time. Mm. Uh, for a lot of these people in the Shinsengumi, the first record we have of them is them joining the Shinsengumi. We don't mm. know what their life was like before that. There was no census. No, no. reason to keep track of it. I grew exactly. up, I uh, <laughs> farmed, and th that's what I did until this happened. <laughs> right, and, and there's a lot of complexity there where they would claim things. Uh, yeah, so uh, some of the records are there, some aren't. You have to really fill in the gaps. Mm. Uh, but Kenshin was hugely popular, and it helped to establish this idea of, uh, of this as a, um, um, a, of a time fraught with sort of moral choices, mm. and things like, along those lines. Uh, you also see it in Peacemaker Kurogane, an anime series from a little while ago, uh, which deals with this. 
Uh, mm. But if you really want to see this in detail, there is a live action, 50 episode live action TV series uh, called Shinsengumi. And it was made in Japan, I believe about a decade, 15 years ago, something like that. Mm. And it really goes into huge amounts of detail. Now, because it has to fill in all those details, you know, who knows? But it tries to be as historically accurate as possible. Any English subtitles for those yes. of us who don't know? <laughs> That's the nice thing, nice. is that this was, in it, it, official English subtitles. This is done by NHK, and the official Japanese release includes English subtitles. What was the name of that series again? Shinsengumi. Oh, well, just like this. There we are. The subject. They made it very easy <laughs> for us. Uh, and you can find... Um, um, you can find it online in various places and bits and pieces. If you want to, if you want to check it out, there, there are clips on YouTube to get a feel for, for the And how long was this series? 50 episodes, 50 hour-long episodes. episodes. Mm, that's, so, a, that's a good amount of, uh, a good, good series. I, I could get invested in that. Yeah. <laughs> and the nice thing is, because Kenshin was so popular, they made a lot of the characters from Kenshin look a lot like the Kenshin characters. So, so it's an easy transition. Yeah, from... so for those of you who've seen it, you'll recognize Sonosuke <laughs> and, and Saito's in it and a lot of these characters, and they're very recognizable. So they kind of use the Kenshin version of those characters <laughs> when they can. Um, another, case, another place where you can see the Shinsen Gumi in a way is in Ghost in the Shell. Oh, now that's a very modern... <laughs> There's robots in that. Yeah. So how, how do we see the Shinsen Gumi in... Ghost in the Shell. Section 9 is basically the Shinsen Gumi. They're a futuristic version. An elite squad. An elite of the elite. Yes. Under control mm -hmm. of Section 9. Yep. Separate from... Exactly. The mm -hmm. Prime Minister. Yep. But, but government formed. Government, government funded. formed. Uh, but with all the politics going back and all forth. All the politics. Uh, wow. You know, who, who gets who credit for what? Who controls and yep. what credit. And exactly. And... Uh, Continued and a, programs and and, and a, a a strong hint that was throw, thrown into there is that the Shinsen Gumi had a motto. Mm. Uh, they chose one word from Bushido that they wanted to just encapsulate everything that they mm. believed in, and it's a wonderfully ironic word. It is a Japanese word for sincerity. Hmm. They wanted to be completely sincere. Hmm. Just considering how everything worked out and how they fell apart from within, <laughs> it's amazing. Oh wow! And that word in Japanese is makoto. What's the first name of Meiji Kusanagi? Makoto, Makoto. Kusanagi. So yeah, that's the, 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 the strong that, tie. That, that's the key there. <gasps> oh, wow. Exactly. It's stuff I'd never know just watching the series. Uh, and it's a great series. Oh, yeah. But now it's, uh, you're, you're giving me more depth mm -hmm. into it. And yeah. And it's very interesting seeing it as this kind of... And, and it adds another level once you know that to realize when you, when you see that in Ghost in the Shell there's a certain futility to some of the mm -hmm. things they do. Or they accomplish things, but there's this sense of this much larger world where all these things are going on that they're fighting So against. much political dynamic mm -hmm. and the struggles, yeah. both internal and external, yep. uh, within the government and uh, outside mm -hmm. when uh, interdepartmental. And... Yeah, it explains that whole tone of it that they do accomplish a lot, but... How much do they really accomplish? In the I have to go back things? and rewatch the series <laughs> with this history in mind because yeah. that that sheds a whole new light to the mm -hmm. to the story. Yep, exactly. Wow. Futuristic Shinsen Gumi. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So they, there's this 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 is an era where the double sword has yes. already been something that's been part of the samurai uh, world for for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And that was that was part of the Shinsengumi's... Absolutely. And so it's an important thing is the Shinsengumi were samurai. So mm. everything that applied to samurai applied to the Shinsengumi. Uh, they also had these uniforms that we see, these lovely mm. blue and white uniforms. Oh. There's a slightly uh, more specific one here where you get to see the, the, the complete uniform. Um, now, they didn't wear these all the time, but these became kind of their standard uniform. Mm. Uh, and they had these, these white peaks on them which represented mountains. Oh. The, the, the solid mountain that never... Oh, on the sleeve there, yeah. I see the... Yeah, so mountains never change, just as their, their sincerity. Their sincerity. <laughs> uh, and they, they had the double swords, uh, and they had the, these ropes that they would have, which they could uh, use to tie the, the, uh, it around so if they were fighting, mm. it wouldn't get in their way. Wow. That's what that's for. And you can also see in one of these outfits also a, a little wooden whistle. Yes. Um, and so that is a, like a policeman's whistle. Uh, so they'd blow that to alert Call their attention. comrades. Yes, uh, let, let them know that they'd found a terrorist or what have you, and they were uh, they were chasing them through the streets. Wow! It's a it's a very romantic time in that sense. Um, it was it was a time when Japan was was struggling with a lot of issues, 
and uh, the Shinsengumi were a dramatic element of that time. Wow. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for sharing that with us. You bet. And I'd like you to join us uh, for the next episode. And if you've enjoyed uh, Culture Shock, uh, check out some of our other episodes of Culture Shock. And if you'd like, put in a request for any subjects. Yeah. Uh, and uh, check out our website at geekarchaeologists.com. Yes. We go deeper. We get. <laughs> we do. <laughs> See you there.